Thank you very much for wishing me a happy birthday. I'm 56. Now you all know. You're not wondering anymore. Um, before, I, before I start talking about uh, the process that um, we use and just kind of giving, imparting to you um, how, what goes into doing an animated um, short film, um, I wanted, it just occurred to me just now, I, we really need to talk about why use an animated short, for, uh, for short film versus a live action film in the first place. And it, it has occurred to me that there's several factors involved in that. Number one is we found that um, in many parts of the world, it's difficult to walk in with a film crew with tripods and big cameras and all that and make a film without attracting a lot of negative attention. Um, I knew a story of a guy one time in China that got kicked out for filming a buffalo that fell into a ditch because it reflected poorly on the government somehow. So you have to be, you have to be careful sometimes how you make a film. And it, so the advantage to cartoons is you can go in and record the voices in a studio somewhere that's, you know, unseen by um, the, you know, the prying eyes. And then you come back and you do all the actual work in your home country. So in that sense, cartoons can be useful. But even more so, I find that if you are working with a culture that has a really strong um, artistic sense, like a, a history of, of embroidery or a certain kind of art, then to use their art to tell the gospel is really, really powerful. And I, I can't tell you the number of times that we've seen that happen where people will look at something and go, oh, that looks like our... Um, you know, our, our style of painting, this, this really touches me, you know. And so that's the kind of thing that you can get when you're, when you're using art to share the gospel. And we found that to be um, true in most of the cultures that we've worked with. Um, every culture has their own art forms, but some, some are more uh, outward and more obvious than others. So I'm gonna um, just encourage everybody on how to do animation. Don't have much time. I'm actually going to cover it all in two minutes right now in one film, which I can thank Todd for sharing this with me. So this will tell you everything you need to know about how to be an animator. OK, that's it. You can all go home now. Um, so the process that we use uh, at our studio, and it's constantly changing every year. I just, I just updated this because Last year was different than this year, and uh, uh, I think probably every production is going to vary somewhat. But um, we kind of divide our process into three sections, um, pre-production, production, and post-production. And at the beginning, we always start with research. Uh, we begin with Google, of course. And uh, from there, we, we also communicate with our project partner. We gather information from the internet, but actually whatever we get from our project partner always takes precedence. So if there's a disagreement, um, for example, right now we're working on a project for the Nashi, and the Nashi people have a, um, a background, a religious background called the Dongba religion. And we were really excited about trying to find bridges in this, but once we talked to the people on the field, they said, nobody believes that anymore, right? Yeah, the, the, this um, pipeline's in your notebook if you want to refer to it. Um, so we found that whenever there's a disagreement between what we see on Wikipedia or, you know, Ethnologue or whatever else we're looking at, we always go with the project partner. They're the ones that are going to be using the film. They're the ones that know their people group the best. And so we, we always um, default to them. So we also do, um, we'll explore musical themes. We start sketching different kinds of uh, concept art. What are the backgrounds going to look like? What are the characters going to look like? Um, but even before that, we're already thinking of different story ideas. We brainstorm. Uh, we're using a program, an online program called Basecamp to get all our ideas together and communicate on the project. Um, and then from that, we go into the script and then have the script translated. So by the time we start our production, which is on the field, we need to have a completed working translated script. And that process takes a while because we're going back and forth between uh, us and the project partner on the field. So when we get to the field, we're usually there anywhere from a week to two weeks. 
And there's really three reasons why we go there. Number one, we have to record voices. So that could mean anywhere, that could be anywhere from one voice if it's a narrated film or, you know, up to six or seven, hopefully not too many, uh, depending on how many characters there are in the story. And, uh, and then during the time that we're recording, the rest of our team will be storyboarding. Um, and part of the team will also be going out doing research. They're going to museums, villages, performances, just to get a real sense of what the people group is like. If we did all of this from the internet, we would certainly not really capture the heart. So, so we, it's very important, even though we're doing cartoons, to go there, to go to the field, get to know the people, you know, experience how they think, and enjoy the food, of course. I threw that in for Steve. Um, then we come back to our studio in Taipei, and then the fun part begins. And by, by fun, I mean hard work. Um, so we take it from a storyboard level to something called an animatic. Uh, an animatic is sort of a semi-animated storyboard, which helps us work out how long each um, individual shot is going to be. Um, unlike regular filmmaking, where you might go out and shoot 30, 40 hours of film for a one hour production, and you, know, you only use a small portion of that, we really don't want to animate stuff that we're not going to use. Because it, it takes us, um, I think we figured out one time, like something like three weeks per minute. So we really don't want to be animating stuff unless it's going to be used. Those, those um, outtakes that you see Pixar and other companies doing at the end of their credits, they're not really outtakes. So um, we also do character turnarounds. That is designing what the character is going to look like. Those are kind of like standard sheets, what the character is going to look like from different angles, um, backgrounds. Uh, we do the voice processing. Some of the project partners request that the voices be disguised. So we'll put them through voice disguising software. Um, and then we pull all that together into Adobe Flash and do the individual shots. And I think our, our productions have ranged from, I don't know, 120 to 200 shots for a, for a film. Um, then we go down to, we export those and put them into uh, Apple Motion where we add effects like water, fire. Um, you'll see some examples of that in a minute. Uh, stuff that's easier to animate using um, particle generators as opposed to doing uh, doing it in Flash. From there, we go down to the editing phase. We also pull the, we pull the voices in. And during this time, from the animatic, we have somebody usually doing our, our music. Uh, we gather music from the field, but we like to have original music done. So we work with different people um, to do the scoring for the film. And then we end up with a, a final product, which we export for online distribution. And also, we're still doing uh, DVDs. Um, some parts of the world, they're still being used. So that's kind of our, that's kind of our production pipeline. And as I said, it, it varies because each time we do something a little bit different depending on what artists we have and what the, what the needs of the people group are artistically. So, so I'll, just to give you a few examples of this process, um, I brought this one up at the, at the EMDC. This is a film we did called Coconuts um, in Rajasthan. And we did this one for 10 languages, so we, only, we, we limited it to two characters so that we'd only have to record two voices because everything had to be multiplied by a factor of 10. So if we had five characters, it would have been 50 voice recordings. So we limited it to two characters. One of the ways we, we uh, dealt with that issue is one of the characters in the film never talks. He's like a, a four-year-old boy that just whispers in his brother's ear. You only know what he says. You can only tell what he says from the reaction of his brother. Um, so we start out with art and cultural research. Here's some of the artwork that we found in uh, Rajasthan. Very colorful, very bright culture. It's such a pleasure to be there. Um, they use these wooden puppets. They do puppet shows. And uh, so we based the gospel portion of our film on this kind of style. And then we started writing treatments. We had all kinds of ideas. Uh, we knew we were going to do it about a story about two teenage boys that steal something. Originally, we had them stealing um, butter, which is, you're probably wondering why. If you have a Hindu background, you know that there's a, 
uh, story where, um, I'm trying to remember who it was that stole some butter when he was a child. Anyway, they didn't like that idea, so we changed it to peanuts. So, and we write the script after that, and um, get it, we, in this case, we had to translate it into Hindi right away, and then on into the different 10 Rajasthani languages. For character designs, essentially, we had two different styles of animation going. We divided the team up in half, and half the team worked on the story of uh, Abhe and Bhagwat, who are the two, two um, Rajasthani boys in the film. But then when they hear the gospel, we go into a different style of animation where we use this um, Rajasthani puppet style. So these are the, these are the characters for the, uh, the main story. And then these are the, some of the character designs for the puppet style. And then we go and do the storyboard. So that's a lot of work. But we have everybody gets involved. We divide it up so that pe different people do different sections of the storyboard. Uh, we compile all of it in a database program called FileMaker Pro. Uh, that way we can add in frames and take out frames without having to, you know, mess with paste up and all that. Um, then we go on the field for our production and do the voice recordings. Sometimes we use ho hotel rooms, people's houses. Um, best situation is a recording studio, but we don't always have that available. In Rajasthan, we did it mostly in hotel rooms. Um, one point, we actually had the power out, and we were having the person read the script with our iPhone flashlight, you know, but you do what you have to do. Um, also do the research. We found a lot of culture there that added to what we'd already researched on the internet. And then we produced our animatic. Here's an example of what an animatic looks like. So it's essentially the, it's essentially the storyboard that we then, um, turn that one down. So it's the storyboard that we um, just scan in, and then we start moving the frames around and make sure the dialogue, you know, how long the dialogue is for each shot, where we're going to do the cuts. And when we make these shots, we always buffer them by one second after and one second before, because that way the editor has a chance to do a crossfade or whatever. So we never just do the length of the shot. We always buffer it. Um, and then we go into... To, um, uh, post-production and do all of our work in Flash. Early on we were doing, we were combining the backgrounds and the character animation in Flash, but lately we've, we, this last project we didn't do that because we found that certain, uh, if, the, if the file's too complicated, it's really hard to work in Flash. If you have too many things going on, too many symbols, it gets bogged down and uh, has a hard time exporting. So now we just do the characters in Flash and we combine them in uh, motion, which I'll show you a little later. So here's, uh, for this Coconuts film, here's the trailer so you can kind of see the finished product. Kai, tu bhooko hai, Bhagwat? Haan, mone bhook lagi hai. बेटा कहीं भी हो तू हाउट तो है अरे मैं कटे हाँ क्या किस्मत वाला हो कि मारी सत्संग में आया So um, one of the things I wanted to point out, too, is that when we do um, these different films, we, we will adapt the stories that we tell. We're, we're, we're not going to be able to tell the entire 
Bible from start to finish in, you know, a couple of minutes. So we actually pick and choose what stories we're going to tell based on um, the worldview of the culture and what they may already know. For, for example, most of the projects we've done for animist groups in China, we will often establish the whole story of how Satan fell from heaven because that establishes where uh, demons come from because there's a lot of confusion between what is a demon, what is a ghost in their culture. They use the same word for both. So, um, but with this particular film, we didn't do that. We started with the birth of Christ. We wanted to show that Jesus had a miraculous birth, that he performed miraculous signs. So we emphasize his miracles a lot more because that was what, that was what um, would speak to their heart. And uh, sometimes we show Adam and Eve, sometimes we don't. So it just kind of depends on the culture. We, we pray about it, we talk to the project partner and find out what would be the best way to share the gospel in that particular culture, because we're limited in the amount of time we have. So, so here's the second one I want to show. This is the one we did just um, last year. And the people group is the Shangshan No Su Yi, and they're in southern um, Sichuan and northern Yunnan, right around uh, Xichang and, and uh, um, Lijiang. So this particular people group had a fairly well-established religion called Bimoism. Um, they had shamans in their culture, which did things like demonic possession and fortune telling. But above that was this level called a bimo, which was a sort of a, a keeper of the tribe's holy scriptures and a person that you would go to for wisdom. And so he was a perfect like, person of peace to put into the story to share the gospel, which is what we often look for. Um, so we researched their culture. Uh, again, beautiful artwork. They're known all over China for their lacquerware. Um, colors, often black background, yellow lines, and red. So when we did the gospel story in this particular one, we decided to use those colors so that they could relate. This color, we don't realize how important color is in culture. The, the guy on the left here is a BMO. So we, we uh, researched that whole thing an awful lot. Um, came up with the treatments. Had lots of different ideas, but we settled on a story of a poor guy who's an alcoholic, his brother's a drug addict, and they don't get along very well, so they have a fight, and uh, he almost kills his brother, runs off in the jungle, and then he meets this Bimo by the fireplace, and the Bimo shares the story of Christ with him. Um, the nice thing, too, about this culture is they had their own written language. Most of the Chinese groups we work with, they'll, they might read and write Chinese if they're literate, but their own language usually doesn't have a writing system. This particular language well, it had a very well-established writing system, and you could see it around town on the signs. Um, <clears throat> a little hard to find the font for it, but we managed to track down a SIL font for it, so thanks to our SIL friends. Um, here's the script. Uh, so we started out with some character designs. These were the early designs that we came up with, and we crossed, we, we, I'm just gonna show you kind of the transition and how our character designs go from something like this to something like this, which is the final characters. So they change quite a bit. And uh, as a matter of fact, this, this particular project was a little bit of a challenge because we had, um, in July, when we started production, we had shown the project partner our, our final character designs. Um, and one of them got back to us, but the other one didn't. And we had trouble reaching him, so we went ahead and did the production. And then in September, when we showed it to him, he's like, well, the Bimo's not exactly right. He looks too Chinese. So we had to go back in over the next few months and change all the shots with the, with the Bimo in it. That was a bit of a, that, that added quite a few months to our production to make those changes. But that happens. So here's our storyboard. Uh, we got together, it, we did a lot of our storyboarding on the field. That's our team sitting in China at a, somebody's dining room table. and. Um, Here's what the storyboard looked like for that one. And uh, here's some of our on-field uh, recordings. This, this photo on the left is them discussing the clothing with one of, the, one of the project partners, what kind of clothes they would wear. We were actually doing it for two different groups, one in Lijiang, one in Xichang, and their clothing was slightly different. So we tried to come up with something that would work for both, something that was close enough. And then here's the animatic. This is the scene, the 
fight scene between the, the two brothers, which you'll see in a minute in the final trailer. When we storyboarded it, we were using our original character designs. So these are the, these are the earlier characters. But this gives us some indication of how long the shots are going to be and what we, need to, what we need to animate before we even start the animation process. So then we go into our post-production, working in Flash. As I said, in this case, we just did the characters in Flash. We didn't bother putting the backgrounds in. Uh, we compiled it instead in motion, which enables us to get uh, depth. We can do zooms, we can do pans, we can do lighting effects. Uh, particle generators to create things like fire, water, and smoke. And, um, and then, yeah, the lighting is what's really cool. Is we, could, we could add a flicker lighting to it, which um, several projects ago, we actually did that by hand in Flash, which was a big pain. So anyway, so here's the trailer the, for this film. This is a two-minute trailer. The actual film is 13 minutes long. And if you want to look at it, you can do a search. We've got it up on Google with English subtitles. So um, one of the ways in which we're able to do these films with a small number of staff uh, is that we do it in connection with a training program, which we call the School of Cartooning and Animation for Missions, which we run uh, once a year in Taipei. And it's a six-month school that is part of the um, YWAM's University of the Nations. So it does require uh, a DTS. So if anybody wants to get this kind of training and how to make these kind of films, and you want to take a year out, do a DTS in Taipei, or you could do a DTS here at Cre uh, Create Thailand, and um, take this school. And we'll train you how to do this kind of thing. But if you don't have that much time, um, this year in particular, we're doing some shorter seminars of two weeks each. So I just want to mention these, because uh, actually the first one starts the day after tomorrow. I'm starting on the comics and cartooning seminars. So this is a two-week seminar that's open to non-YWAMers. You don't have to have any uh, prerequisite at all. You can come and spend two weeks learning about comics and cartooning. Uh, first week, we cover mostly Western-style comics and um, uh, comic strips, comic development, comic theory. Uh, the second week, we have a, a real Japanese manga instructor who comes from Japan. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Manga Messiah series. She did the first uh, she did the Old Testament books of that. So she teaches the second week of that seminar. Uh, we also are doing a digital graphics seminar, which is one week of Photoshop, one week of Illustrator. We teach 
the overall program, but we're focused more on how to use those to prepare for, um, to pre prepare something to be animated. Um, and then finally, we have a seminar on digital 2D animation, which is taught, uh, one week is taught by me, the other week is taught by uh, our animator instructor from Singapore, who um, used to work with uh, Nickelodeon Asia and does a lot of Nickelodeon style, Cartoon Network style animation in Flash. So if you're interested in any of these, you can go to this website here. Um, we don't have the cost on the website, but the cost for the two week for a two week seminar is six thousand Taiwan dollars. Which you're going, how much is that? It's about two hundred U.S. something like that. That doesn't include room and board. We'd have to work that out separately. So anyway, if you're interested, there's an application on there. You can just uh, contact me at the email at my email, which is also on that website. And I think we have just like one minute, 25 seconds for questions. Any burning questions? Yes. You want to, you want to get him? The, does he have, a, you have an extra mic? OK. Huh? <laughs> now, what's, what's the name of the? Uh, Speak into it. What's the name? There we go. What's the name of the program you use for disguising voices? Because I've been unable to find something like that. I don't like Audacity. It doesn't do it very well. Uh, let me. I think it's called. It's actually used by gamers to disguise their voices when they're playing games. It's called um, Morph Box. M O R. -F oh, it's not up there. M O R P H V O X. Yeah. Not. It's not too expensive. Anybody else? Yeah, Todd. What is the image time you use for pre-production Well, um, because we do it with our school, so we're kind of locked into that schedule, we have 12 weeks of pre-production. But that doesn't usually start until the second or third week of our school. So essentially probably about 10 weeks of pre-production, then about 10 days of production, and then about anywhere from three to four months, typically, of post-production. 